somebody at the organization who manages the Chosen's Facebook page. I have no idea who this is. This is what they said, quote, Here's the bad news. Your religion, your church, the law, your efforts to be righteous won't save you. Here's the good news. You don't need your religion, your church, the law, or your efforts to be righteous to be saved. Close quote. Reason number 777 why I have chosen not to watch The Chosen. It is because rejection of religion is a rejection of what is right, good, and true. A rejection of religion is a rejection of God himself. And today I want to share with you reason number 777 why I have chosen to not watch The Chosen. I know, I know, you probably love The Chosen. You probably rave about it. Maybe you get together with your friends and you do watch parties, you know? what? I don't know. Listen, I'm not here to judge you, but I'm going to share with you the reasons why I have chosen, for me and for my family, for me and for my house, we have chosen not to watch The Chosen. And I saw something yesterday that triggered me again. Now, some of you, I mean, you maybe you've been hanging out with me for a while now, for the past few years, and you probably know most of my reasons already. If not, I will share them with you here in a moment. But something new happened yesterday that triggered me even further. And I want to share that with you now. So when I was on scrolling on Facebook, yeah, I know it's Lent. I, I got it. You know, a lot of people have abandoned Facebook or social media for Lent. And that's that's amazing. Praise be to God. Unfortunately for me, it's part of my job. So I was scrolling through Facebook yesterday and uh, someone had tagged me in a post that was linked up to the chosen Facebook page. Okay, so I take a look. And the post says, qu I'm quoting you here. Okay, this is somebody at the organization who manages the chosen's Facebook page. I have no idea who this is. I'm in no way suggesting this is Dallas Jenkins, the, the director, producer, or or is it Jonathan? R no, I don't, I doubt it's any of them. It's just somebody else. I have no idea who, but this is what they said, quote, Here's the bad news. Your religion, your church, the law, your efforts to be righteous won't save you. Here's the good news. You don't need your religion, your church, the law, or your efforts to be righteous to be saved. Close quote. Th this, whatever, whoever typed in this other stuff, I take big, big issue with. This is an old argument. It gets uh, warmed over fairly frequently about, uh, you know, the we don't need religion. We're, re we're spiritual, right? We have a relationship with Jesus, not a religion. But that doesn't pass the smell test on a number of levels. And I thought I would, uh, I thought I'd discuss that with you today. So this is my reason number 777 why I have chosen not to watch The Chosen. It is because rejection of religion is a rejection of what is right, good, and true. A rejection of religion is a rejection of God himself. How can I say that? Well, Last night, I decided that I would, uh, you know, look some stuff up. I, I had some my, my own opinions of this type of thing. But last night, I looked it up in the, what you know, what is the definition of religion? Well, Thomas Aquinas has a definition of religion in his Secunda Secunda. And, uh, you know, I double-dog dare you to argue with Thomas Aquinas, the greatest teacher in the history of the church, says the virtue which prompts man to render to God the worship and reverence that is his by right. Religion may thus be defined, according to the Catholic Encyclopedia, religion may thus be defined as the voluntary subjugation of oneself to God, that is, to the free supernatural being or beings, on whom man is conscious of being dependent, of whose powerful help he feels the need, in whom he recognizes the source of his perfection and happiness. St. Augustine would say, we are tied to God and bound to him by the bond of piety. He says that is the definition of religion. I think we can summarize all of that, Augustine, Aquinas, or what have you, as it is the virtue of justice. We give to those what is owed to them. If I owe you money, I, uh, then I must give it to you. 
I owe you a decent show every day, so I have to work hard, get up very early in the morning, and do stay up late at night doing my research, doing my homework, trying to get the kinds of guests that I think are going to be good to provide insight into the complexities of life in this world to give you what is owed to you. You deserve a great program, and the team at the Station of the Cross is working to provide that to you. It is just, it is right, it is good, it is true that we do that. It is a virtue. Well, how much more then do we owe it to God to give our very selves to him? We give Him ourselves privately, and we give ourselves to him, say it, say it with me, publicly. And what is that public part? That is called worship. I wonder, golly gee whiz, do you think possibly, is there any chance that God might have an opinion of what that worship looks like? Hmm, or is it just left to you and the Holy Ghost? Hmm, I don't think so. There is, in fact, there is, in fact, a pattern, we might say. We might say that there's a pattern that we could follow. I mean, you don't have to be a biblical scholar. You don't have to have gone to seminary or the Moody Bible College or any other place that you like to come to these patterns very quickly. What did we see in sacred scripture? Just go very go right back to the very beginning. There is a pattern of how worship works. Even with Noah, Noah was given a very clear set of rules and guidelines to offer sacrifices, to have some animals that were considered clean and some animals that weren't. Some animals that were set aside for sacrifice and worship. Even Abraham was told, given very specific instructions on how to execute an, an offering unto God, a covenant to create a covenant relationship with God through sacrifice. We see that same thing going all the way to Moses, who was commanded through the burning bush to go back to Egypt, no matter his stuttering problem that he claimed that he had, a little ploy to get out of it because he didn't want to go. But nonetheless, go to Egypt and save my people, he was told. And he went. Finally, Aaron helped him out. And they confronted uh, the Pharaoh. And they had a war with the gods of Egypt. And guess who won? I'll give you three guesses and the first two won't count. That's right. God the Father did. God, yes, yes, you are correct. The only one true God destroyed these fake gods of the Egyptian peoples by the plagues. Yes, that each plague was a plague on a Egyptian god. What's the message being sent? There is only one God, and him alone shall you worship, and they shall go three days' journey to the mountain, and there they shall render worship. They shall render unto God what is right, good, and true. And what do they do when they get there? I mean, go look it up, Exodus 24. Moses takes 12 priests, sets them on 12 pillars, and they offer 12 sacrifices. And Moses collects the blood from the 12 sacrifices, combines them all together, and on the main altar, all facing liturgically east together, Facing the rising of the sun, meeting God at the rising of the sun, there Moses sprinkles the blood on the altar, and then he turns and sprinkles it on the people, and they share in the blood of the covenant. Now they are one. God the Father and his people are family now because they shared the blood. What happens after that? Oh, yeah, it gets better. They go up the mountain, and there they enjoy a vision of a meal together. Woo, man, who goes up there? Moses and his inner three. Moses, his inner three, the 12, the 72. Seems to be a pattern there. I'm starting to notice these patterns of sacrifice, of liturgy. Okay, well, go read Leviticus. All commanded by God. All of it. Every bit, last syllable commanded by God. God was very intentional Okay, the golden calf did change things. I agree with you. I see where you're going with that. Yeah, that's true. They didn't start that way. They ended that way because of the stiffness of their neck, the hardness of their heart, and their rejection of God, the Father as God the only. And they turned their hearts back to those pagan idols of Egypt. And so after the golden calf, they got the plan B instead of the plan A. Nonetheless, all of it dictated by whom? By God. God dictated every last syllable 
of all of it. Every effort to build the tabernacle, to to worship God, all of it. And then he inspires David to even further organize them into choirs, 24 choirs, which we see in the book of Chronicles, to set up liturgical music, the Psalms, all of it commanded by God. Even Solomon continues this down the line, keeping the same patterns, by the way. We see these same patterns move forward into the life of Jesus. By the way, Jesus one of the most religious, I would say, the most religious character in, in all of Scripture, old or new, you're going to find Jesus is the most. Guess what? He kept the law perfectly. He, had, he went to every single feast in Jerusalem that he was commanded to go to or he was supposed to go to as an Israelite male. He went to them all. Every Passover, every Sabbath day, he kept the law perfectly, never missing once. By the way, so did his mother. Huh, guess what? Without the stain of sin, not even venial sin. Yes, I'm tempted to smash like a, a like a chocolate bar right right now. I could if it was in front of me or a cheeseburger. Man, I would go to town. I would need those things, but I'd want them because of my concupiscent nature, not the blessed mother. Uh-uh. She is not going to be tempted by a one pound bag of peanut chocolate covered M&Ms like I do. Okay. She's not going to have that problem, but I do. She doesn't have that problem because she has no original sin. She has no stain of sin. She resisted all temptations. Unlike me who gives into them at a moment's notice, she doesn't have that problem. And yet she gave herself over to the rite of purification 40 days after the birth of her one and only son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. So not only was Jesus keeping the law perfectly, but so was his mother. And we see the pattern because go look in the book of Revelation. It is smells and bells nonstop 24 seven. So God has an opinion of worship. God has an opinion of how we live our life. And God is owed our worship and our adoration. He is owed this in the virtue of justice that is religion and we owe it to him and if the chosen should reject this notion then i reject the chosen they are subtly teaching error and therein lies the rub if you are smart enough intuitive enough know your faith enough sure you could watch that and point that out you could pick out error from truth and avoid the pitfall but what if you're not what if you aren't that savvy? What if you don't know your faith that well? What if you're a young child and you're impressionable and you watch this and somehow you get the idea that this is okay, this is right, this is good, and then some anti-Catholic starts hammering you as a Catholic based on some similar points and you think, whoo, because it got reinforced in your mind based on this portrayal not just of Our Lady, but of theology itself, on the nature of Christ and what he's come to do, to give you a church. Christ did not come to die to just give you himself. He did not need to die to give you himself. He died intentionally and on purpose. The agony in the garden, do you understand what happened in the agony of the garden? In the agony of the garden, Jesus is being tempted by the devil in an effort to not get him to die. The devil does not want Jesus to die on a cross. The devil wants Jesus to deny the cross. Jesus, in his agony, is seeing the temptation before his very eyes of your sin. The devil taunts the Lord with your sin, with my sin. He sees the sins of all of us in the garden. How evil you and I are, how bad we are, how many mortal sins we commit, how many blasphemes we utter, how much hate, anger we spread through the world, death, destruction, lying, and all the rest that we are spreading in spite of the fact that we have been given this great treasure found in a field of the Catholic faith and the sacraments. The Lord is looking up in agony in the Garden of Eden, and seeing you and me. How easily would it have been for the Lord to say, you know what? <sighs> like, if, he'd, if it had been me, <laughs> if it had been me, I would have like, I'm not doing it. Forget it. They ain't worth it. Bye. I'm out of here. 
Uh, you know what? I ain't going to the cross. I'm not going to have my my skin ripped from my, from the bones, my skin dangling off the body, barely hanging on. I'm not going to get, uh, you know, thorns piercing my skull into my brain. I'm not going to have uh, the, bl- I'm not going to tolerate the blasphemies and the, and the, uh, the utterances of these creatures that I created against me for the sins of you. I'm not going to be doing that. Uh, no way. It ain't going to happen. That's how it'd be if it was me in the garden, but that's not how it went down. Our Lord said, Lord, let this cup pass from me, but yet not my will, but thy will be done. How many of you, raise your hand, would say, let, let not, not my will be done, but thy will be done? Our Lord and Savior Jesus did. He intentionally went to the cross. They didn't take him there. He went there. He conquered Calvary as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords ahead of an army of saints and angels. He attacked the Mount of Calvary, and he conquered it, and he divided its spoils, because that is the seat of the Satan, the prince of the world, whom he conquered, the strong man whom he conquered, and he divided his spoils while on the cross, because that is the one place the devil wanted Jesus not to go. That is where he went. So, if, in fact, we watch this stuff, and if, in fact, they are, and I'm correct, and they are uh, they are wrong, and who am I? I'm just some lowly radio dude. They could be perpetuating error in the minds of impressionable people who aren't prepared to withstand the conversation, the arguments, or whatever. You know, <clears throat> I've told this story a bunch of times, but some of you are new, and so I shall share it with you. Years ago now, as Eduardo Verastigui would say, years ago, I was going to Holy Mass at a parish, the most, the oldest parish in town, and uh, the most, uh, at the time, the most traditional parish in town. And um, when I show, by, by the time my family shows up, the the last Mass was getting out, and we were kind of, we were getting ready to go to Mass. It was like the 11, 11.30 Mass or whatever. And um, there was a dude with a bullhorn out front screaming and yelling through the bullhorn at the Catholics. I've seen it before. We've all seen it before. And, you know, our ushers were there like, listen, just ignore him, just ignore him, just ignore him. I'm like, okay, fine, whatever. <clears throat> and he's he's spouting off <clears throat> with his bullhorn. And we go to Mass. And we get out after Mass, and there he is again. You know, he's spouting off. I'm, like, I'm thinking, well, my kids are listening to this. Like, my kids are kids are listening to this. But we, we walk to the van, we go to the park and then walk to the van and I get to the van and I'm like, I can't do it. I, someone, someone, someone has to stand up to that dude. I just can't walk away. I cannot allow my kids to see me walk away from that blasphemer. I cannot allow my kids to see their dad not stand up for what is right, good and true. Couldn't do it. So... I went <laughs> marching back and I stood there on the street. There was a street in, uh, in that separated us. He was on the other opposite side of the street and I was on the church side of the street. And this is downtown Houston, Texas. And I proceeded to scream at this man, the top of my lungs. And I don't care. He had a bullhorn and I served in the Marine Corps and I win every single time. I guarantee it. <laughs> and I let this man have it. And I let the, I mean, and they were like, oh, Joe, don't, don't, don't do it. And I'm like, no, forget this. Someone has got to answer this. Someone has got to answer this. This man cannot stand here on our street corner and not be opposed in any way. He cannot see Catholics who will say nothing and be silent and never do any darn thing. They must stand for the truth because the truth will set them free. And that man deserved in charity to be set free from the bondage of his ignorance. And so I let him have it. I brought up Matthew 18. If your brother sins against you, where do you go? I said that to him. You have sinned against us. Where do we go? Whose church do we take it to? I got witnesses. We're more than two. So whose church do we take it to? Do we take it to yours? Because which church did Jesus mean exactly in Matthew 18? He said, take it to the church. He didn't say the churches. He didn't say the church you feel like today. He said the church. Which one is it, brother? Is it yours? Is it mine? Is it the one down the street? Which one? Hmm? 
He didn't know. He didn't have an answer. Because Jesus is very clear. If you don't even listen to the church, then you're to be excommunicated, cast out like a tax collector, like a sinner. It is clear from from the life of our Lord, from his own very words, that he is religious, that he intends and means religion for the world, that he has given us the, the, uh, the perfection. I'm going to say it that way. It's not going it, to, it's going to sound weird to our ears, but the perfection as the Summa Theologica, as St. Thomas Aquinas points out, the highest form of religion is Christianity. You find truth in every level of human society, even atheism. You can find truth, and where you find truth, you find Christ. Let's be clear about that. But the highest perfection, the fullness of truth itself, is found in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. It is clear that that is where we find it, and that religion is based on the virtue of bonding ourselves to God in a covenant relationship. We do so privately in that relationship, but we do so publicly in worship. And as I pointed out during the show, golly gee whiz, guys, just turn anywhere, anywhere worship is, is being discussed in sacred scripture. You find liturgy, liturgy from the Old Testament to the New. Go to the New Testament, go to the apocalypse, John's vision of heaven and liturgy. You see liturgical actions, vestments, priests, smells and bells, sacrifices, litanies being being said constantly, rote, repetitive prayer over and over and over again. The action at the altar is a work. It is not a good time. It is not a good feeling. It is not a communal meal. It is not a gathering of the family. It is giving God what is owed to him. He, we owe it to him to give our adoration and our worship, and we do so at the Mass. The vestment the priest wears, the chasuble, is a work apron. It is meant to cover him for his duty, the work he is performing, which is sacred. Therefore, the apron itself is elevated from the mundane to the holy. The apron, the maniple on his arm was supposed to be a napkin. You know, it's supposed to be a napkin. It is now ornate and glittered because we take as an effort to show God our intentions of our heart these ordinary things, and we make them as special as possible to communicate back to God our heart's intention of being, giving, and wanting to be in his presence and give him adoration and worship. This is why we can't have clown masses, because God is due and owed our very best, our most and greatest, highest intention. Look at, this is St. Ignatius of Antioch, in the year 110 AD, in his letter to the Samaritans, paragraph 8, flee from schism as the source of mischief. You should all follow the bishop as Jesus Christ did the Father. Follow to the presbytery as you would the apostles and respect the deacons as you would God's law. Nobody must do anything that has to do with the church without the bishop's approval. You should regard the Eucharist as valid, which is celebrated either by the bishop or by someone he authorizes. Where the bishop is present, let uh, there, let the congregation gather, just as where Jesus Christ is, there is the Catholic Church. Without the bishop's supervision, no baptisms or love feasts are permitted. On the other hand, whatever he approves, the bishop, whatever he approves pleases God as well. In that way, everything you do will be on the safe side and valid. This is 110 A.D., Ask your friends who oppose the Catholic Church and religion about this one. Have they ever read this? 110 AD, Ignatius of Antioch. And uh, most of you will know this, but maybe some of you won't. Erica, good morning to you. 
Thanks for hanging out with us today, by the way. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, guess where he learned the Catholic faith? Guess where he learned the faith at all? John the Apostle. You know, the guy who stood at the foot of the cross and watched our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ die slowly for you and for me, who took Our Lady into his home on that very day because it was the will of God the Son on the cross dying for you and for me to give to you and to me, through the Apostle John, his own mother. Do you accept this gift of the Lord or do you reject this gift of the Lord of his blessed mother. John the Apostle took her in and cared for her until such time as she should be called into heaven in her beatific vision, body and soul. She is the Gibi Ra, which is part of the design of the Old Testament. I tried to make this uh, point in the last, uh, in that segment and during the radio program, but I ran out of time because uh, I failed you today to prepare well enough. But nonetheless... When you look at the old uh, Old Testament, uh, you see you see the trend. You got Moses, you got his inner three, you got the twelve, you got the seventy-two, you got liturgy. You also have a queen mother in the Old Testament. David's kingdom had David as king, his inner three, his twelve. He had a Sanhedrin, and he had a queen. <clears throat> his Solomon, his son, who took over, bows down to the queen mother, the Gibi Ra. In First Kings. So the 12 continued to have a job. The 12 ministers had a job in the kingdom of David. And that, that happened all the way until the Babylonian exile. Their job was to provide for the house of the king and the inhabitants of the household. That was their job. The queen mother was always the mother of the king, never the king's wife, ever, ever, ever. It was the Gibi Ra and the king that was taken off and changed to Babylon at the Babylonian exile. Guess what? There was one among the 12 who had the primacy, who bore the keys right there on his shoulder. And everybody could see him walking around town. Oh, there goes the prime minister. He's got the keys of the kingdom of David. He bore the ring of the king and he rode in the king's chariot. He had all of the smells, bells, and accoutrement of the primacy of these 12. That is the chief steward, and that would last until the Babylonian exile. Which is why, when the angel Gabriel comes to visit this little young woman in this town of Nazareth and proclaims that her son would be the inheritor of the kingdom of David, you can assume then that he is also going to inherit all of the accoutrement of the kingdom of David. All the smells, the bells, the liturgies, the inner circle of the three, the twelve, the prime minister, and the Gibi Ra, which is why when Our Lady hears that proclamation of the angel, it means she realizes she is now the Gibi Ra. Or as soon as she says fiat, she says yes, she accepts the role as the queen mother. And then she also knows that her son, the now the Messiah, would have to fulfill Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. And all the rest of the prophecies, like Moses' own prophecy, that someone greater than him would come and die on a tree. Did you know that's a prophecy of Moses? Yeah, that's a prophecy of Moses, and Our Lady knew that. You're never going to find more religious people than Jesus and Mary, ever. Sorry, taint going to happen. Taint a thing. At any rate, I have no other opinions of this subject. I feel, uh, you know, whatever. You want to watch Chosen? Watch Chosen. But as for me and my house, nope. It ain't going to happen. As they say, the bling. <clears throat> Are you talking about the bling maniple? Oh, yeah, man. You should have seen the rose-colored vestments of our priests. Ain't no pink going on. <laughs> I can tell you that. <clears throat> They're beautiful. They're actually very beautiful vestments. All right, I think I've said it up. Teresa, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Thank you for everybody for tolerating my rant today. And maybe someday I'll, I'll publish my book. Such a great show today. The Lord is upon us. Praise be to God. Sharon, thank you. God bless you. God love you. And we'll see you tomorrow. <laughs>